Bar that is something uh, I'd allow us to take a third reason for it. What can everybody hear? <laughs> Practically every uh, primary care physician in South Florida is going to encounter patients with Alzheimer's uh, disease. He or she can either refer the patient elsewhere, which is often uh, the case, or accept responsibility for comprehensive care. And comprehensive care, it, 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 it is. It's uh, complicated because really you're uh, inheriting not just the patient, but you're inheriting an entire family. And as the disease uh, progresses, the uh, care given to the uh, family, the time to the family, and the caregiver actually exceeds a great deal of the amount of time that you give to the uh, patient. And since it is a downhill course, uh, it's somewhat frustrating. There is no uh, treatment for the, unfortunately, uh, for the cognitive impairment at this stage. But uh, there is a lot that can be done to make the disease uh, uh, better for the patient. You can help the caregiver handle the, uh, the patient better. And it's got a lot of uh, rewards. Um, I'm going to... Uh, refer to our handout, but unfortunately not everybody has, everybody has one, but we will be getting it to you sometime during, during the uh, session. But uh, I'll go over it uh, slowly, and uh, you can follow along what we're talking about. There are uh, certain things that the uh, physician uh, has to uh, have uh, in his chart. And I'm calling it the essential charge information for the chronically demented uh, patient. And the, uh, the first point is the diagnoses. Now, you notice I didn't say diagnosis. Uh, it is a very important, first of all, to establish the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but the patient often has other diagnoses as well. They may have heart disease, they have diabetes, hypertension, uh, various other things. So we can never lose sight uh, uh, that the patient uh, has multiple, multiple diagnoses. Uh, regarding the diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementia, it's very important that um, when the uh, patient comes to the office, often brought by the, 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 the spouse or the husband or some other members of the family, and they've noticed that there have been changes in behavior, changes in cognitive uh, function, that the physician doesn't get fooled uh, because many patients with Alzheimer's disease are very uh, adept at uh, their uh, social presentation. They uh, look perfectly normal, they uh, have no complaints, uh, they can answer questions, uh, but when you really uh, do a cognitive uh, test, you'll find that they have some gross deficiency. And the worst thing that the physician can do is to just tell the family, oh, he's okay, he's getting a little bit older, and uh, you know, not really uh, focus in that the patient is, in fact, uh, has a serious cognitive uh, impairment. This is somewhat uh, devastating to the family, and then the, the family doesn't uh, realize that the patient, uh, who may not be cooperating too well, the, the concept that, that uh, he won't cooperate because if, 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 he, if we know that he has a, a disease, a dementia, it's that he can't cooperate. He, he, he won't do things because he, he, he has a brain disease. It's not that he's being you know, difficult or argumentative. And it's very, uh, very important that the caregiver have a diagnosis so that they can uh, start getting information, they can start making communication. Uh, with families and friends and the community so that they be, can become informed of the disease. Uh, the worst thing is just uh, being in limbo. And maybe there's something wrong, maybe there isn't. Uh, so a, a diagnosis has to be established. Unfortunately, with Alzheimer's, we don't have a, a simple uh, foolproof test that says somebody has Alzheimer's. Uh, but it, it, you can be uh, reasonably certain uh, of course, it is a diagnosis of, of uh, exclusion. You have to rule out uh, certain types of problems, drug problems, uh, uh, metabolic problems like thyroid disease, uh, depression, and so forth. 
And folks, oh, yeah. part of our handout is uh, we're going to discuss uh, some of the factors that can cause dementia other than Alzheimer's or can make the cognitive impairment of the Alzheimer's patient worse. This was at Pritikin. So the diagnose, diagnoses and diagnosis is very important. Now the uh, second aspect that should be on the physician's uh, chart is the symptomatic and functional history from the patient and caregiver, including the time and speed of onset and the rate of apparent decline. Now, um, all Alzheimer's patients uh, are different. Uh, some have a, a clinical course where things are stable for a number of years. They, they live five, six years. It's a very slow progression. Others have a very rapid progression over a year or two where they're totally incapacitated and uh, dependent. So the physician has to have some way, just as if you when you're, uh, you follow the weight, you follow blood pressure, you follow somebody's growth when they're a child, be sure that they're, they're growing at a certain level. So there's a, also curves of the way somebody uh, declines, and it's important to, to have that uh, documented so you can make some meaningful uh, interventions. And uh, periodic uh, cognitive uh, testing is important uh, to, to see where somebody is uh, standing, have they gained, have they lost, and if they have lost in certain areas, um, you can focus in on the areas that are preserved, so uh, perhaps they aren't able to uh, communicate uh, too well, uh, but they can still enjoy uh, hearing people, they can enjoy music, they can enjoy the sounds of the radio, um, they can enjoy going to uh, concerts and so forth. There are areas where they can enjoy it and, and uh, find, find fulfillment. The uh, third um, element is uh, continuing assessments of functional level and this has to do with their ability to care for themselves, how to the ability to drive, to manage their own affairs, uh, to address themselves and uh, part of our, our handout, uh, I don't know for those who, who do have it, uh, I have two uh, sheets which uh, go over the um, Activities of daily living, uh, such as use of telephone, shopping, food preparation, housekeeping, laundry, uh, taking medications. Uh, hopefully, uh, do we have them here now? Okay. Who
Yeah, A of course would be uh, the hardening of the arteries, uh, things that may cause uh, stroke and so forth. There's no reason that the Alzheimer patient uh, can't have a stroke as well as a primary disease. So um, the physician always has to be uh, looking for uh, additional problems that could be uh, aggravating the condition. And uh, so that's, uh, that's number uh, four on uh, table 610. Number five is objective uh, mental status test. We need that interval. And uh, this is felt to be worth uh, whatever the cost and time. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, it helps the uh, caregiver, the physician, and other professionals who are working with the patient to um, work uh, with the areas of the brain that are best preserved. And also uh, to possibly try to improve some of the areas that seem to be on the decline. It is felt that uh, some of the uh, mental functioning can be uh, improved and reversed by, by proper techniques. Number six, uh, a profile of the caregiver, family problems, their strengths and attitudes. And here uh, on the board, uh, I have like a family tree. And uh, for instance, uh, this is the patient with the arrow. It's a, it's a, it's a male and it's a square and this is the Y. Uh, they have three, three children. And uh, here, this uh, indicates a contractual relationship. Uh, now why, as well, perhaps we'll say the, the, the wife has uh, illness uh, or there may be We'll say conflicts between the, the, the primary, between the patient and the wife, and the, this person here has sort of uh, taken over the uh, primary caregiver role. Well, she has her own problems. She has a husband here and, and several children. And um, if the physician um, keeps track of this as part of the chart, then the, you can have the age, uh, where the uh, children live. Um, and uh, this way, uh, every time the, the patient comes to the office, you don't you don't have to start from scratch. So you know, tell me about your your children. You can sort of keep track of um, what's been developing uh, in the uh, 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 family relationships. Who who this person can rely on for some help, um, and so forth. So I think that's um, uh, helpful. Uh, number seven um, is analysis of living circumstances and their suitability for patients' current and future needs. And here we talk about the uh, environment. Uh, the environment has to be uh, modified for the Alzheimer's patient. It has to be made uh, safe, so-called Alzheimer proof. And uh, you have to consider things that are hazardous, such as the uh, kitchen. Uh, you have to be sure the stove can't be turned on. Uh, that uh, doors um, are uh, locked, uh, especially at night, to prevent some of uh, the patients from wandering outside and uh, getting lost or getting hurt. Um, and it's also mentioned that, uh, advised that uh, uh, locks on, on doors should, if possible, uh, be somewhat disguised so that the outside patient isn't just uh, pulling on the door, getting frustrated, and, and, and trying to, to get out of a door that he can't, he can't work the lock. So if you can disguise the door or cover it, it, it makes it uh, better. Um, number eight, a cumulative list of other risk factors for further dependency. And um, this would include other uh, illnesses, uh, as we mentioned before, other chronic illnesses, heart disease, diabetes, uh, uh, arthritic problems which uh, impair mobility. And uh, also, uh, we should consider in, in this category the caregiver's uh, attitude. Uh, the caregiver uh, can uh, unwittingly uh, foster dependency uh, by uh, not allowing the Alzheimer patient to do the things that uh, they're able to do. Like, uh, it's sometimes easier for the caregiver to dress the patient uh, themselves than to um, let the patient actually try to, to, to do this type of a task. And uh, the uh, 
caregivers should um, make the, uh, for instance, like with dressing, uh, the clothes can be put out or they can be put in a closet which just has the clothes for that particular day. The Alzheimer patient is unable to, to make choices, so they can't decide, well, what, what should I wear today? They have, it has to be set out. And then, for instance, they can't uh, dress themselves completely, they can dress themselves partially. And certain type of clothes uh, can be modified so they're easy to put on Velcro uh, shoes instead of that you know, tie. Because after all, when we think about uh, getting dressed, it is a it is a fairly complex uh, task. You have to do a couple of one thing, and another thing, and all the other patients can't do that. So the, uh, prime, the, the caregiver has to allow the patient to do as much as they possibly can. Uh, like around the house, the patient can do certain uh, activities that are very structured, they're easy, they can, they can assist, instead of just sitting and doing nothing. So it's, it is very uh, important that the uh, caregiver not uh, make the uh, patient uh, more dependent than they have to be for their stage of the uh, disease. Okay, number nine is patient and family's known wishes about institutionalization and resuscitation. The uh, issue about institutionalization is very important in that uh, many uh, times a, a caregiver will uh, stay to the patient, to the family, um, that they're not going to put the patient into the institution. And then uh, later on, as the disease gets much worse and the stress on the caregiver is so great that uh, they're not unable to manage, then they have to go into an institution and then there's the guilt feeling and all the, the problems that that engenders from uh, the family. Uh, uh, the, why did you have to put my father into an institution? Uh, so it's, uh, it's recommended that the physician uh, and other professionals advise the caregiver early on not to make any strong promises in that, in that respect because uh, the situation will change and uh, institutionalization may be necessary. Is there a question? <coughs> we can stop for questions, by the way, if uh, anybody has anything to go on. Well, that's another issue we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, also, it's important to have uh, the patient and family's wishes known about resuscitation, and uh, this should be done early while the uh, patient still has uh, some cognitive. Um, abilities. Uh, many people these days are very uh, well tuned into issues of resuscitation and it's something that uh, the uh, physician should encourage that uh, this, is, this is made known. And then of course as the disease uh, changes this can be reassessed too. Number 10, plans for wills, fiscal matters. Uh, this uh, should be done early in the course of the disease, uh, right after the diagnosis is made, because um, many times the caregiver may be an elderly uh, woman. Uh, she uh, may not have much uh, background in financial matters, about wills, and uh, she does not have access to uh, money. Uh, so. She, she has to get power of attorney, she has to understand, get help, uh, legal help, uh, accounting help, whatever, so that she does, uh, or he, does have the uh, ability to uh, provide financially. And that would sort of you know, address your, your question, um, that, that you have to have funds somewhere. Yes? Okay, number 11 in uh, table uh, 610 is uh, current and probable future needs for uh, assistance. And uh, here, uh, one, uh, ha the caregiver has to be uh, uh, realistic as to what her, her, her needs are going to be or his needs are going to be. Uh, support groups, uh, counseling, friends and family, 
And this also should be on the uh, medical uh, chart. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions on that uh, table that we just uh, went through? Excuse me, does anybody not have that table? Yeah. Now I'd like to just shift gears uh, uh, briefly and talk about the physician's um, uh, interaction with the uh, caregiver. The uh, caregiver is a so-called hidden patient. Uh, the physician has to emphasize his concern for the caregiver's well-being. Uh, the physician has to uh, assure that he or she is a available uh, continuously or somebody um, another physician uh, you know if uh, actually somebody to go away you need somebody to back you up but there has to be the, the content that the physician is available for for all types of problems and the physician has to emphasize that the caregiver uh, the caregiver's approach to the patient will greatly influence uh, what happens with the patient regarding uh, behavior, mood, uh, disruptiveness. The uh, caregiver must actually uh, uh, follow ten basic principles. Uh, it's not in your handout, but I'll, I'll go over it slowly. The, the first one, uh, number one, is they have to be realistic regarding the nature of the illness, and they have to make uh, plans accordingly. At the present time, uh, there is no uh, effective treatment for the uh, cognitive impairment, and uh, that has to be known, and, 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 the, and the caregiver has to know that this is going to get worse over a period of time, that, that the needs will, will, will change. Number two, the caregiver has to recognize the need for help. They have to seek it, they have to accept it, and sometimes they have to pay for it. And uh, we know that a lot of uh, caregivers, especially uh, older older ones, are often reluctant to accept any uh, help and assistance. Number three, they have to find a support group very important. Uh, fortunately, in our community now, there are a number of uh, support groups. I cannot emphasize how uh, important that, that is. Number four, the caregiver has to communicate with other family members, and they have to tell the other family members, they have to tell it the way it is. They, 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 they can't minimize the, the problems. Uh, a lot of times, uh, I have had the experience where the caregiver is reluctant to tell the children and tell the friends that how bad the, the, the situation really is because they just want to burden the, their family and their friends. But it's important that they get this out because they, they really will need the help and support of their family and friends. Number five, the caregiver has to maintain their own health and they have to get adequate uh, sleep they need a physical outlet. Uh, they need a uh, social uh, outlet, social contacts. And uh, in, in the handout, uh, we do have a, uh, it says behavior problems of patients cited uh, by a patient. And I would like you just to look at the bottom table, table three. Those problems caregivers uh, cite uh, for themselves. And uh, we see chronic fatigue, anger, and depression. And 87% of the uh, responders uh, gave those symptoms. Uh, the second, family conflict, 56%. Uh, loss of friends and hobbies, no time for self, uh, 55%. And uh, this is where the, 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 the caregiver, no time for self, is like 
it's like always being on call for the uh, for the patient. There's never there's never a time for rest. And 30% uh, worry that caregiver will become uh, ill due to all the stress. Okay, so maintaining health for the caregiver is extremely important. Uh, I mentioned the contact of the, hit, of the hidden patient. When the physician takes on the responsibility of an Alzheimer's patient, he should be sure that the caregiver is either under his care uh, or under somebody's care because uh, they often do neglect themselves. Number six, plan for the future, uh, socially and financially. Because after all, um, despite the efforts and the devotion and the time and the, the weariness that the caregiver develops with all the work and the, and the frustration that eventually the patient will die and uh, there has to be something after for the caregiver. Number seven, uh, be informed, uh, be educated and by proper uh, education, a lot of the problems that the Alzheimer patient will present can be really anticipated. <coughs> and these problems uh, can then be, you can develop coping uh, strategies uh, so that uh, you aren't caught by surprise. You don't have these emergencies developed because you've thought about them and, and uh, for the most part they can be anticipated. Number uh, eight, plan financial and legal aspects. And here, once again, you must have sufficient funds in that power of attorney. Number nine, continually work to find and em enhance the preserved uh, function. We've already uh, talked about that. The caregiver is the primary uh, advocate for the patient. and. Uh, has to use a lot of ingenuity to try to, to make the individual's life as uh, pleasant and, and functional as possible. And uh, this, uh, especially like uh, with uh, communication and speech, the uh, Alzheimer patient uh, is able to understand things, but they have trouble expressing themselves. They often, when they speak, they lose uh, their thought in the middle of a the sentence. They, somebody has to sort of like be a word finder for them. That hopefully uh, would be the, the caregiver. So the, the caregiver would sort of know what, what the patient was trying to say and help them. Uh, number uh, 10, 